one. Hello, my name is Maria Brent and I'm part of the teaching team here at Royal Holloway. My roles of uh, teaching involve safeguarding adults, personalisation, learning disability. But the purpose of this podcast today is to help you as practice educators and students get a sense of some good practice guidance around involving service users and safeguarding adults. Before we start to look at that in more detail, it might be useful to just look at the broader context of safeguarding adults. So if we're thinking about one of the key policy documents, No Secrets was published by the Department of Health in 2000, and that really does set the overarching response in terms of how local authorities respond to safeguarding adults. What's interesting in adult safeguarding, it's complex, it's challenging, there's not one piece of legal statute, if you reflect back to Children's Services and the Children Act, we don't have a similar thing in adult services. So in terms of safeguarding, you need to be looking at civil and criminal law. So it's fragmented, it's patchwork, and it's complicated. There are some key legislation though that you do need to think about. The Mental Capacity Act is really fundamental in terms of how we respond to safeguarding adults because ultimately adults have the right to make unwise decisions and I think that for students, practice educators, frontline social workers can often be a really complex challenging area of practice. The other area of legislation is the Human Rights Act. So balancing up the Mental Capacity Act, safeguarding procedures and also Article 8 particularly of the Human Rights Act where people actually have the right to have a a private life. They may not want the intervention of uh, social services. Interesting enough, No Secrets Review underwent a widespread uh, review. Uh, A number of people were consulted in that process. Many service users were involved in that. And some of the key messages coming out of that was actually service users said, we we feel often that you come in with your safeguarding adults policies and procedures, and safeguarding is done to us, not with us. We have our set procedures, and service users are often left on the periphery, um, and they don't feel that they've actually got a voice. So one of the key messages that we need to take away is making sure that we keep service users at the heart of the process, that their voice is heard, listened to, that we really do involve their participation in the whole safeguarding process. I think what's interesting, what I'd like you to think about as a social work student and a practice educator, is thinking about your experience. Have you ever made a bad decision? What does that feel like? You've put your trust in somebody and they've abused that trust. How do you feel? Embarrassed? ashamed, you want to keep that quiet. Think about the service user's experience, that you've made that bad decision, you've trusted somebody and they've let you down. And then that gets taken into a really public arena where you have a range of professionals scrutinising you, looking at your decision making processing, looking about actually why did you make that decision and how that might feel. So I want you as students and practice educators and social workers to really hold on to that because I think it gives you an insight to what that might feel like for somebody who arguably their self-esteem is already felt disempowered because they may have been abused. But then for us as social workers, students, practice educators, in terms of the power, how that might affect the service user in that process. Now in terms of practical elements, There are a range of research uh, literature reports that we'll upload onto Moodle for you that explore the service user's experience. Sky have got an excellent report, Report 47, uh, which explores it in more depth and there's a range of research that we will upload for you. But in terms of practical terms, if we're thinking about our Pan-London policies and procedures, so we have our No Secrets, We have Pan-London policies and procedures, and even if you're working outside of London, you'll have similar policies and procedures in local authority that you'll need to adhere to. Now, those policies and procedures cover the seven stages, from the alert of a safeguarding, to the referral, to the strategy meeting, case conference, protection plan, review. And it's how do you, as a social worker, social work student, practice educator, make sure that you support the service user through those processes. One of the key messages, again, from service users is actually make sure that they've got the time to understand the procedures. I think as social workers, we're very procedurally led. I've got my time frames. I need to complete this stage in four hours, five days, 20 days. And of course, the procedures are there for a purpose. Um, They're necessary and they give us guidance to make sure things are done properly, but also making sure that we don't become so procedurally led that we actually lose sight of the service user in that process. 
So as a social worker, social work student, practice educator, if those time frames slip, if you can actually evidence why well, you need more time to support the service user in that process, that will normally be taken on board. So let's think about practical steps. You're supporting the service user in an investigation. What do you need to be thinking about as a social work student and practice educator? Time, making sure that we have the service user has enough time to understand the information. It's non-jargon that we don't use long, uh, complicated terminology that's leaving the person confused about what's happening. It's also thinking about the location. If you need to interview somebody, think about the location. What's going to work for that person? Ask them what's going to suit them best. If the safeguarding abuse investigation involves maybe a family member, clearly the home environment may not be the best place for them to be interviewed or um, consulted with. It may be that you could look at an alternative, might be the day service, might be another place that would be confidential and safe for that person to talk through with you what's happening for them. Some adults may well be uh, particular times of the day. Um, they might be more alert, particularly if people are on a range of medication. As the afternoon goes on, trying to engage them in an interview, they might become quite tired. So it's working with the person, well, what's going to suit you? What time of day? What location? Um, considering that they might need support around communication, so that could be an interpreter, it could be advocacy, it could be actually looking at um, communication aids. So it's really making sure that you demonstrate and you record the steps that you've taken to try and support that service user, to make sure that they're empowered and involved in that whole process. I think what we also need to do as social work practitioners and students and practice educators is move away from that binary where you've actually got the abuser um, and the abused or using the new language now, the adult at risk and the adult who may, be, may have harmed. Because as social work practice there's a whole range of complicated issues in the middle of that. So supporting the service user may involve a family member. They often may not want their family pulled apart. So it's often working with those family members, considering them the person who may have harmed in their own right. Do they need a carer's assessment? What support might they need in this process? You may well be thinking about family mediation as well to support the service user to make sure that they've got a voice and ultimately making sure that their voice is heard right throughout the whole process. For a social work student, making sure that you record, that's essential, that you record in an objective and a timely way making sure that that's um, taking out the emotion, looking at the facts, and also demonstrating and recording and evidencing how you've reached your decision making around supporting that service user in the safeguarding process. Those are some of the key areas really. Now in terms of uh, moving forward, the service user involvement we'll be looking at uh, in the future is how do we make that more meaningful? So many local authorities are looking at service user involvement at their safeguarding boards, making sure that they have a voice there. Looking at different forums, the service user who's been involved in the safeguarding process, what worked? What actually made a difference to their life? Thinking about the power issues as well, for us as, as a social work student or practice educator, you may not feel very empowered as a social work student, but actually you go in to support that service user with the whole weight of your organisation on your shoulders. So you do need to be thinking about issues of power as well. It's a really interesting time of change. We have No Secrets, which is arguably 2000, quite outdated. We've now got the Care Bill, which is currently going through Parliament, and that will have uh, quite a wide impact on how our duties and responses to safeguarding adults. Uh, Clause 42 puts a duty on local authorities to investigate safeguarding. Clause 43 puts safeguarding adults' boards on the same footing as children. It's a really exciting time to be involved in adult social care. And when the care bill is actually implemented, watch this space because there will be more changes to come. Thank you.